Hey everyone, welcome back to Breaking Chains and Building Dreams. I am JC, your host, and today we're diving deep into the heart of transformation. Get ready to embark on a journey of resilience, redemption, and renewal as we explore the path from wrong to strong. So buckle up, join me as we navigate through these challenges, triumphs, and overcoming adversity. Suban Salaso Burban, because we're about to get started. Hey guys, what's up? This is JC with Wrong Strong. If you are part of my team, mi familia, mi raza, you already know what time it is. Because we're about to take a ride. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Breaking Chains and Building Dreams. JC, your host. <laughs> well, today I'm going to talk about a little story that happened in Mexico while I was in prison over there. You see, uh, the drug dealers there had a lot of money. They had control. So they used to, uh, they used to do these soccer tournaments. They would, uh, get their own players. Uh, they would pick out, you know, they would draft them out of the guys that were in prison. There were some guys that were really, you know, bad drug addicts, but they played really good soccer. And everybody would build their team. Everybody, all the drug lords would build their teams and, you know, supply money for 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 uniforms, for shoes, for, for food, water. You know, they would take care of, of their players, give them drugs, you know, uh, liquor, all that stuff. And um, they would get ready and play tournaments. Um, the thing is, is that at the end of every tournament, it was like, it always turned out bad. Everybody, somebody always got beat up. It always turned into like a bloodbath. Like people getting stabbed, people getting beat up. And it was always, I guess, at the end, it always happened at the end, like the playoff game. Um, it would just get really intense and really hot and people would react and, <laughs> and they would get into fights. You see, what I try to tell people is that in Mexico, life is very different. Um, there's, there's, it's like normal to be violent over there. I don't know how to explain it. Everything is, is more, como si la vida no vale nada over there. Like it, life is cheap over there. Right? Like you, you see, you know, people getting murdered, you know, they, they actually show it on the news in Mexico. Like they show the people when they're like killed on the floor. Like you get very, very disconnected to see death and it becomes normal and you become, uh, you know, I guess immune to it because you, you see it, you hear it, it's happening around you all the time. And it was just, um, it was just a different kind of violence over there than it is over here. You know, over there it was more like normal, common, just they would do it. Over here it was like, I'm pissed, you know, uh, I hate the government. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just different. It's just different violence. And, um, you know, I, I, I knew how to maneuver my way around a lot of this stuff in the Mexican prison because, uh, I mean, I grew up on the streets. I grew up on the streets. Uh, I grew up in a really gang-infested neighborhood, and um, I knew how to maneuver my way around because that's what I did as a kid in Chicago. I had to walk all the way to Cicero sometimes where my dad lived, and my dad lived over there by... There's, there was a, a swap meet place on Cicero and Rulio Belt, and he lived on that side of town, and there was kings over there, there was noble knights there they there was just different kind of gangs and i had to walk around and walk through all these neighborhoods i had to walk around uh two six when i used to go to boxing school dark side you know k-town all over there and, and then walk to the king's neighborhood and then the sd's neighborhood and and it was it was crazy maneuvering and driving around all these spots you know and that's what i tell people is that if i wouldn't uh been in my prime of my violence when I was in prison in Mexico, I wouldn't have survived. I wouldn't have made it. And if I would have made it, I would have came back more messed up. Did I come back messed up? Yes. But I also saw 
the rest of the Americans that were on that plane and they did not look good. They had seen some stuff and it really had affected them. I had, I seen it in their eye, in their eyes. So that's what I mean is like, you know, I'll sit here and think about all the stuff that happened to me in the past, but it's almost like it got me ready for, for the future because something that could have broken most people didn't didn't break me. I was able to, you know, rise from it and not get better, but I mean, I survived it. And I know that the American Council knew that we had seen way too much because the first thing they did when they when we landed in Latuna Federal Prison is they pulled us into a room and they started showing videos about like Vietnam vets and how they came back with PTSD. But they didn't call it PTSD back then. You know, they were still trying to figure out why everybody was suffering from all that, you know, when you had seen too much. And uh, um, they gave us a whole class on it. You know, I even raised my hand and I, I told them about everything that happened in Mexico. And I got, I think it was, almost seven years taking off my sentence for pain and suffering. You know what I mean? And every day that I did in Mexico counted as two in the United States. So when they resentenced me, I got immediate release. And that's why, uh, you know, they, they sent for the uh, Texas Rangers to come and get me because they were supposed to extradite me all the way to Chicago because I was wanted over there for uh, a shooting case. And, um, I know I got a little bit off topic because I was talking about the Mexican, but <laughs> my story has so many avenues that it's, it's hard to stay on one because it pulls me in different places. So, you know, I ended up in El Paso at the county jail there. You know, I mean, you guys have heard my, my story or follow my story. I, I've told it. I will tell it again on, on this platform, but, you know, Mexican prison was was tough for a lot of Americans. It was, it was, it, it was, it was a bad place. And I survived because I was already in my, in the prime of my violence. I had already seen a lot on the streets of Chicago. I had already been through a lot as a kid. So it was almost like a walk in the park. It wasn't really, no, I shouldn't say a walk in the park. I shouldn't say it, but I'm not gonna lie. That's how it felt when I went through it because when I got on that plane, I looked back and I said, I, I made it, you know, they didn't kill me because they they wanted to kill me really bad in Mexican prison. Like, they, uh, you know, National Geographic didn't really do it no justice. They showed an episode where, you know, they're pushing me out and they say, you know, let the, let the jail kill him because that's what they really thought. They really thought that the uh, poor people were going to kill me because of, you know, I, I, I was bad when I was there and I, I thought I was better. And it, it's crazy how to see what God did, you know, because, um, I never shared this story, but when they kicked me out and sent me to the poor unit, um, they really thought that those people were going to, you know, do their dirty work, that they were going to pretty much kill me in there. And I ended up winning everybody over over there. Everybody felt bad for me, actually. And when they sent their guys to come and get me after they seen that they weren't doing nothing to me, um, all those people stood up for me. All those people in that unit stood up for me. And that's why, you know, you see me saying it on the show, you know, I, I feel, I feel guilty to this day for how I treated people. Because at the end of the day, they were the ones that stood up for me and didn't let people hurt me because they, they wanted to hurt me. And to see that all these people got up and said, no, you know, uh, it was, you know, it, these are uh, emotions and, and memories that I have that affect me a lot to this day, but they keep me really humble. They keep me, I guess you could say aligned with the course that I'm on right now. And just the way everything is going in, in my life, uh, you know, God has really done a, a number on my heart, uh, on my life, on my relationships, my kids, just everything, everything. And just to think that I get to work for him now, like I get to share my story with 
with inmates, with drug addicts, with like just everybody and anybody really because I kind of have a connection to a lot of people. I've been through a lot, I've seen a lot, and I've done a lot. But man, nothing compares to love to God and what he's doing in my life. And just this newfound love that I have for this for this podcast thing. I went in and I bought me like a mini pro thing for different, you know, shots and angles. I got me these microphones. I got the whole get up, the whole setup. I'm so excited to set up like the background and everything. And, and it's like a new way to, for me to be able to share my story and share my, not only my past, but today and what I have planned for the future because I've been dreaming this for a long time. I've been dreaming about this halfway house here in Phoenix for a very long time. And I'll share a little bit with you guys. My dream involves getting like a, a ranch and really pretty much in the middle of nowhere to take away, to just take the women away from the city and let them heal, you know, horses, dogs, ranch work, let them clean up, let them feel pretty again, you know, have a room where they can do their hair and everything and, and just help them get on their feet like really the, a stable, stable ground. And, and and remember guys, I've been down this road a million times. So like, I know what these men and women need. Like I know that what's needed. What are the most crucial moments? The three, the first three months are the most crucial moments from somebody that's going, that just came home from prison. Six months are important. A year, it's even more important because they get comfortable. So, you know, it's, it's, I, I call it the, the X-Men school, you know, because like, I'm gonna bring people there and, and teach them how to become warriors, warriors from down and send them back out to fish. You know, Ronda Strong was, was created for something way bigger than me or, or anybody like on my team. Like it's, it's why I do all the work that I do. It's why I, I feel that this is this is like what I need to do in my heart. Because if God was able to change my heart and, and get me through everything that he got me through, it's gotta be for a reason. It's, it's gotta be for a reason. And I truly believe that. I truly believe that. Like I, I watched my episode on the National Geographic channel. I watched that episode over and over again. I can't believe how much I've survived, how much I've been through. And like, I'm walking around like, okay, decent. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm going to be good because I'm not. Still have a lot of issues. I <laughs> still have a lot of PTSD. I don't think that's ever going away. Like, you know, when people come up from behind me, you gotta be careful how you touch me or how you come up behind me, you know, it's things like that. But I believe those are like small, small things, you know, like I've gotten better in other things, uh, loud noises, uh, stuff like that people being in the kitchen with me. <laughs> I've gotten better in, on other things, but it, it's I'm always gonna be trying to get better from now on. You know, I, I live a very different life now. You know, back in the day, I never got better because I was always getting high, always drinking, causing more, more problems on top of my problems. Uh, I wasn't growing. I was this little hurt kid that was playing victim, you know, and it, it wasn't until I really got on my knees and like gave it all to God that I actually started to become a, a man. Like I started to become what he needed me to be, not what I let the world let me think that I need to be. I wasn't meant to be a gangster. I wasn't meant to be a killer or, or all those things that they had put in my heart. Nah, nah. God created me with a purpose. God created me with dreams. God created me with, man, like wants and needs. And at the end of the day, he's the one that gives and provides everything, takes, gives, opens, closes, everything. But remember, he knows what's good for you. You know, I tell these stories because uh, they were crazy. Like I remember, you know, watching these guys right after they, they almost win the, the last game, the soccer game, and then they start beating up each other and people got stabbed. Some guy's ear got ripped off. And, and it was crazy because in Mexico, the guards don't come in to stop the fights. Nah, they pick you up from the floor. 
<laughs> that's all they do. They don't come in to stop them, you know. At least in the United States, they start shooting, you know. They start killing people. They start hitting you with those bags. Over there, they just wait till it's over. And, you know, uh, it was it was scary, but like I said, I, I was in the prime of my violence. So, like, it was like another day in the office, really, because in those days, that's how I was thinking. I was thinking that I was going to be a gangster, and that's what I needed to do.